All right, big investor day for Whirlpool down at the New York Stock Exchange. To get right to the man of the hour, Whirlpool chair and CEO Mark Bitzel. Mark, good to see you in person. It's been years. Thanks for having me back. It's been a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So what was your big inve- uh, message to investors? You know, our big message to investors was we're the critical milestone as a company. Um, we have been on a multi-year business transformation journey where we sold and bought some businesses. And now we're just weeks away from completing our European divesture, uh, where we basically take our European business and combine it with a, an, uh, with a Turkish company and own 25%. So it's a critical milestone, and I think we, it was more than appropriate to kind of update investors about bets with different Whirlpool going forward and what our midterm targets are. How difficult is it to transform a legacy, historic appliance maker? And I think the history of Whirlpool was lost on me a little bit. I went onto your website. I mean, this is an iconic company. I mean, how do you unwind some of these things that may not be working anymore? Yeah, you you know, Brian, first of all, I mean, we have an incredibly strong legacy in history. Our company is 113 years old. Um, Our headquarters, literally a mile away from where the company was founded. That's wild. um, We had only 70 CEOs in our history. So it's a company with a lot of legacy in history, but we all recognize, you know, just because you have a great past doesn't mean you have a great future. Um, And the art in this one is, um, not changing the things which work and change the things we, which we might need to adjustment. I think if what we define as a portfolio transformation, but then also what we call our strategic imperatives, I think we've set the parameters right in terms of where we need more pushes um, without giving up our great tradition and history. Um, so I think we found a good balance, and, but you know, it's, this is a highly competitive industry where we're the last American large appliance company. Um, and that was very different when I joined the company. So, but I think we have all the things right to have a great future going forward. You want to get me excited during the week, Mark, send over a slide deck talking about long-term financial targets, but that's what you did at the New York Stock Exchange today. My interpretation was that the first half of the year, because the housing market is still under pressure because of higher rates, it's going to hold Whirlpool back a little bit. Is that the right assessment and things improve in the back half of the year? You know, fundamentally, Brian, it's with our business being so overall driven by the North America business, the North America business in turn is strongly driven, we know, by housing and by product introductions. Um, and we can sp- spend later on talking a little bit about product introduction because there's a really good portfolio. But housing is a big factor, okay, and particularly existing home sales. And of course, we all know, you know, last December was at, what it was, a 28 year low of new existing home sales. So of course, that creates a little bit of an overhang. Um, but, you know, this, the housing market has been soft for almost two decades. Yeah. So the question is not, does it come around? The question is, when does it come around? When now? does it come around? When does it come around? Do you around? need the rate cuts for it to come around? I think, yeah, first of all, the new home starts, they're kind of already recovering. 1.4, 1.46 is getting better. Um, I think we need 1.7, 1.9, I mean, the society. Um, on existing home sales, I think you need probably not just one cut, but two or three cuts. Um, I think you would have to see below 6% mortgage rates on a sustained base to really kind of unfreeze the market. Because again, we, we sometimes lose perspective of what happened within the course of 24 months. So existing home sales dropped from 6.4 million to 3.8. Um, I've, I mean, I, I don't think you've ever seen such a kind of drop. So it literally froze. To, so to fall that, I think it takes more than one um, interest rate reduction. And you know, that's ultimately, we, we gotta see um, when and how it will happen. And it's kind of, by, that, by definition, we're, we're not, it's more a back heavy event um, when it starts moving. And the first half of the year, and we guided towards this morning earnings call, I think will still be a little bit softer. But you know, we know that, we're prepared for that, we have our cost in control, so I think we're in good shape. Has inflation become less of a problem for Whirlpool? Well, you know, inflation was a, a two or three a massive problem. Um, you know, it's, um, overall it added almost three billion, two and a half billion to our cost base. I and mean, these are <laughs> unheard of so numbers. astronomical. Yeah, that's astronomical. So last year we were able to get 800 million of that out of the way. This year, we, we take another 500 million out, so we're still operating slightly higher than before. And you know, some of inflation, I mean, you have wage inflation, that doesn't go away, it just stays there. I think what we do see is now clearly, I mean, we saw that already last year, moderation of inflation rate, and right now it's flat. But again, that doesn't mean that you get all the cost back to pre-COVID levels, so. But I think we, you know, we overall, you know, we're now tackling where we can, logistic costs, um, product costs. Um, we're also, you know, questioning and addressing our overall infrastructure costs. We have, a, we have a simplified business going forward, and as such, we probably don't need the kind of more or less complicated structure which we had before. So, we're addressing the cost on multiple levels, um, 
but uh, frankly, you know, the inflation, we're not counting on a big deflation, just a moderation is already fine. There's been some reporting within the past two weeks on appliance quality. I'm sure you saw these stories. Yao Fine's going to write this stuff. And unless I have, I made a note, I'm like, when I talk to Mark, I have to ask about this stuff. Because appliance quality seems to have gotten a bad rap. Maybe companies have taken quality out of their products so they break and you have to replace them. Set the record straight. Yeah, so I saw the article. It hurt my feelings. <laughs> um, I don't think it is a reflection of the actual facts. Um, so let me explain you why. Appliance life is not driven by calendar years. It's driven by usage. It's like a car. I mean, of course, the more miles you put on a car, that's, so it's not driven by years. And what happened, COVID and post-COVID, people are using it much more intensively. I mean, we see that in replacement markets. So, um, so yes, people are using it more intensively and therefore it gets replaced a little bit earlier than may have been in the past. The actual quality data, and we have pretty good data because we see every single warranty call actually at Whirlpool, I mean, over the last 20 years, every year went down. So we're right now hovering, and that's a more or less non-public number, but we're hovering around a 4% failure rate in first year. So, and that compares to more high single digits a couple of years ago. So we feel very good about quality improvement, in particular in the context of products which got more complicated, have much more technology and electronics in there. So we feel very good about the actual quality rate, but the usage is more intensive. So I think people are confusing two trends here. Uh, and you're also making a big innovation push this year. A lot of focus on small appliances. I think that may have surprised a lot of investors. These are higher margin products? Yeah, yeah I mean, so uh, small domestic appliances is a business which historically was embedded from the numbers in our regional report. So um, in some ways you could refer to a hidden gem um, because we, but it's, it is one of our best businesses. And small domestic appliances, they also, like the majors, live from innovation. So small domestic, of course, in our case, has the strength and the stand mix of a heritage business. But you know, we know from a consumer perspective, in terms of if you ask consumers, what is your most preferred brand on espresso makers? We get a high preference. So It's so, Starbucks, Mark. So, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so in a certain way, consumers give us license to go in sure. other categories. Sure. Um, so that's why we're pushing this year heavily into fully automatic espressos and, um, and semi-automatics. But it's not only a small domestic appliance. We have a, on, on, on a major business, we have massive new launch. We have a new front loader coming. We just launched Maytech pet launch, dishwasher. So, it's not ultimately comes down to, this is an industry, if you stand still on innovation, that's a bad path. And, and we kept on investing. Are you back, when are you back to growth? My, my sense from the presentation was not until 2026 in the US. You know, part of that comes back to what you asked earlier. So the housing will come around. Um, but keep also in mind, even if housing moves, for example, new homes, we're at the tail end of a new home. So a new home gets started, gets built. The appliances are pretty much the last thing before the house is complete. So we, by definition, have a little bit of tail end until we see the full momentum. Um, on the other hand, it's very predictable because we know once a house is being built, at one point the appliances come in. So, so I think what you see behind this one, yeah, from a broader industry, we're kind of conservative, if you want to say so, or moderately conservative, the next 12 to 18 months. Um, but after that, we feel very good. At uh, of course, we're asking all leaders, we're getting ready to head into election season. Now, I remember talking to you in the past about how Chinese companies were dumping various products on the U.S., lowering prices, hurting American manufacturers. Has that started to improve? And what policies have lawmakers put in place that have been helping your business? Yeah, so it's obviously always dangerous if the CEO comments on politics, and, <laughs> and, I, will, and I will try to be careful around this one. You listen, ultimately, this, this is globally a very competitive industry. As I mentioned before, we're the last American appli large appliance company. Um, everybody else, there's two Europeans left and the rest is Asian. Nothing against Asia, but it's just, it's Korean, one Japanese and then Chinese company. So um, yeah, we're competing, if you want to say so, as an American company against a lot of foreign competitors. You know, we are all in favor of if it's a level playing field. Um, we have our confidence, we know how to produce, we know how to cost efficiently with innovation to produce. I think where we, in the past, you know, were concerned if people are selling products in the U.S. below their domestic markets and these kind of things. Um, has it moderated over the last couple of years? A little bit. Um, we're still here and there some categories where we, where we would have some concerns. You know, but at the same time, as a company, we're also particularly focused on the input costs. So for example, for us, steel cost is a big deal. Um, and steel cost, if I buy today's steel in the U.S., it's about twice as expensive as China steel. Um, so fundamental competitiveness of input costs is for us a, a really big deal. All right, let's leave it there. I say, Mark, it's, uh, it's always good to see you. You always give us some of the, the best insight Ryan, in the game. Mark, we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Uh, much more ahead on Yahoo Finance. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>